Over the next few weeks, we are going to tell the story of the American Revolution from different points of view. A Jewish man who just landed in America, a slave, an early abolitionist, a woman, and more. Two important things to remember. One, I am Canadian, so I understand that Canada was loyal to the throne, and it was often Canadians that were fighting against Americans. I promise to still tell the story of America with respect, as I truly love and respect America. Hopefully, my American friends will give this Canadian girl some grace as I tell the story. Two, this is a church history podcast. So, as we tell the story, I will be looking at how this time period affected the church. In this first episode, I'm going to talk about why I believe the Revolutionary War and the founding of America was a pivoting point in the relationship between the church and the Jews. Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want to know how you can support us, check out our Etsy page. I'll have that in the show notes. I have mugs with quotes from church history. Right now, they're all shipped from America, so I understand the shipping is not great if you are outside of America. I was looking for a way to fix that. However, when I checked out the analytics for this podcast, less than 5% of my audience is from Canada. So I will continue to look for a Canadian distributor, but it might take a little bit of time. Also, an update on the book. I have recorded half of the book and I'm getting ready to publish so that there will be an audiobook released at the same time as the book. The story of the church from Jesus to Constantine. We're getting really close to getting ready to release that. All right, let's get into today's episode. Today I'm going to talk about how the founding of America was a pivotal point in the relationship between the Jews and the church. Church history is full of the church treating the Jewish people horribly. Life was difficult under Rome, especially the year 70 AD, which we talked about in an early episode. But when Constantine came to power, it made life much better for the church, but made life far more difficult for the Jewish people. Life for the Jewish people changed drastically when Emperor Constantine came to power in AD 313. Great changes began in 315 when the Edict of Milan took away Jewish rights. Things got worse under the Council of Nicaea in 325. The church officially decided to no longer celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus on Passover, but adopted the Easter dates for its celebration. But far worse, it made it illegal for pagans to convert to Judaism and also made Jewish observations heretical to Christians. The church could no longer practice the Old Testament celebrations. This was a drastic separation of the church and the Jews, and also of the Old Testament. But it was in the year 339 when Constantine made it illegal for Christians and Jews to marry that things began to escalate. In the year 391, Christianity became the official religion and it became illegal to be Jewish. This was the start of centuries of persecution against the Jewish people by the church. This persecution was in Rome, Spain, Constantinople, and Italy. How did this enforcement take place? Well, they forced Jews to be baptized, kicked them out of their homes, drove them out of town. In the year 414, people who claimed to be Christians attacked synagogues and destroyed them. And, since it was the law that Jews were not allowed to build any new synagogues, they could not rebuild them, leaving Jewish people with no place to worship. In 546, it was illegal to celebrate Passover, and Jewish prayers were prohibited. Then came the Crusades. While the Crusades were a call to free the Holy Land from the Muslims, more often Jews were killed instead of Muslims. In fact, some of the Crusades ended up with thousands of Jews killed and no Muslims killed at all. I covered the Crusades in great detail in earlier episodes. In the First Crusade, 12,000 Jews were killed in just one city in Germany alone, and the calls for the massacre of Jews was throughout the Second Crusade. If the Crusades were not bad enough, we have the Spanish Inquisition, 
Once again, Jews were being called to be baptized and anyone caught secretly practicing Judaism was killed, often burned alive. The inquisitions against the Jewish people officially started in 1478 and lasted until 1820. Jews who claimed to be converted to Christianity were often looked at suspiciously, and if anyone caught them doing anything Jewish, they would be tried. In just one year, 300 Jewish converts to Christianity were tried, found guilty, and burned at the stake. Eventually, the Jews were kicked out of Spain. It didn't matter if they converted or not. The Jewish people helped fund trips for Columbus, and some people believe Christopher Columbus may have been a Jewish person who had converted to Christianity and kept his Jewish heritage a secret. The Jewish people funded his trip because they knew there was no safe place for them to live. Finding a new world was their only hope. Many Jews escaped Spain and fled to Portugal. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella believed the Jews were corrupting the citizens. Over 100,000 Jews left Spain and ended up in Portugal. Then there was a marriage contract between Spain and Portugal, and the Jews were kicked out of Portugal as well. In 1215, Jews were forced to wear a yellow circle. In 1240, Jewish books were burned. When the plague came to Europe, the Jewish community was spared because they were following Old Testament laws. Because they did not catch the plague, the church began to teach that they were practicing witchcraft. A little boy named William was murdered, and a monk named Thomas claimed the Jews were killing Christian children and using their blood for satanic rituals. This became known as the blood libel, and the church continued this myth, and even today, many people believe it. The Muslim community also continued this myth. In fact, just two years ago, in a public high school just an hour from my house, there was a large mural painted inside the school that portrayed this myth. Thankfully, there was enough backlash, and the painting was removed. Spain and Portugal were not the only countries to kick all of the Jews out. In 1290, the King of England expelled the Jews, and the French King did the same thing in 1322. The countries where the Jews did live were not allowed to have synagogues or practice their faith openly. In 1348, during another plague in France, the Jews were once again not affected because they were following the Old Testament practices. The church began to teach the Jews had poisoned the water and the fountains. The rumors then spread to France, Spain, and Switzerland, and Jews were rounded up and arrested. In 1349, during the Black Plague, Jews were blamed for the deaths when once again they were the only ones not getting sick. Jews were forced to flee once again. The mob attacks happened in Germany, Switzerland, and what is today Spain. More than 350 separate mob attacks happened during this plague. It's no wonder the Jewish community still today does not trust the church. But today, the evangelical world has a good relationship with the nation of Israel and even helped to reestablish the nation of Israel. When did this change happen? Some placed the change at the Reformation. However, the Reformation didn't end the attacks on the Jewish community. For me personally, I place the point where everything changed at the forming of a new country, America, and one man. Today we're going to talk about his life. You may have never heard of him before, but if it wasn't for his dedication and sacrifice, America might never have been created. In 1740, in Poland, a Jewish boy was born. His name was Haim Solomon. The Solomon family had fled Spain during the Inquisition and gone to Portugal, but they had fled Portugal and eventually moved to Germany and had to flee Germany and moved to Poland. Haim's family spoke many languages because they had traveled and moved so often. He spoke Yiddish, a Judeo-German mix. He also spoke German, and he spoke Hebrew and Spanish and English. Haim's parents made sure he could read and write in all of these languages, and in his early 20s he traveled to Western Europe. He returned to Poland in 1770, however, the Jewish people were being heavily persecuted at that time, so he moved back to England. During his travels, he learned a lot about languages and a lot about finances. In England, he decided to take a trip to New York City. He believed the New World was the only place the Jewish people would be able to be free. So, in 1775, he immigrated to New York City. Either during his trip or soon after arrival, 
he met a man named Alexander McDougall. They would become great friends. Alexander McDougall was part of a secret society. Now we have to take a little detour to learn about this society. In 1765, the secret society called the Loyal Nine was started. Great Britain had five major wars in just 50 years, and they were going bankrupt. To find extra money, the American colonies were taxed under something called the Stamp Act. This act taxed anything made out of paper, and also required the colonies to use products made in England. Then, England created the Quartering Act. This act said if a soldier came to your home, you had to feed them, give them a place to sleep and any medical care they needed, and you had to pay for all of it. People were outraged. The group of nine were trying to find a ways to stop England, but they had no political power. The group of nine found a man named Ebony McIntosh, who agreed to help them. He knew how to get a message to the public. He created pamphlets and posters. But it was one event that changed everything. He made two dummies. One represented Lord Bewitt, the Prime Minister in England that had created the Stamp Act. The other represented Andrew Oliver, who was the one enforcing the Stamp Act in Boston. The two dummies were hung from a tree where the group of nine often met. They called it the Liberty Tree. They did not expect the outcome that they got. Soon a large mob was there, all shouting and angry. The sheriff tried to stop the mob and settle things down, but it got out of control. The dummies were taken down, put in coffins, and taken through town. Then, the building used to process the taxes was torn down. The mob then moved to Andrew Oliver's home. They broke the windows, entered, and destroyed the house. The group of nine realized the people were with them, but they needed help to get things under control. Andrew Oliver quit his job realizing being a tax collector in Boston was not a safe job. But the group of nine had never planned on being a violent group. When McIntosh led another mob to the lieutenant governor's house to attack and destroy his house as well, the group of nine realized they lost control and they needed help badly. A man named Samuel Adams was part of the group, and he had a cousin named John Adams who agreed to help them. John Adams was a lawyer and he said he could help them create a society that would change things without resorting to violence. In March of 1776, the British Parliament ended the Stamp Act, but they introduced the Declaratory Act, which said Parliament could veto any law created by the colonies. A man named Isaac Barry defended the colonies, saying that Britain had caused the Sons of Liberty's blood to boil. The term, Sons of Liberty, was what John Adams used to rebrand the secret society, and the Loyal Nine became known as the Sons of Liberty. They recruited a dentist named Paul Revere, who was really good at writing propaganda, and they put Samuel Adams and John Hancock in charge of the group. These three members, Paul Revere, Samuel Adams, and John Hancock, were all members of another secret society, the Freemasons. Now, we're not going to go down that rabbit trail today, but we will talk about Freemasons in a later episode. But for today's episode, the Freemasons owned a bar called the Green Dragon, and the Sons of Liberty were given a room to use for meeting places in the Green Dragon. One of the members of the group of nine, and now the Sons of Liberty, was Patrick Henry. He would continue to meet at the Freedom Tree and give lectures there about freedom. Up to 6,000 people would attend these rallies held at the tree. Then the Daughters of Liberty started. Women would make items to be sold so other women could purchase items not made in Great Britain. It was the first ever Made in America campaign. We're going to talk more about the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty in later episodes. But for now, the secret society spread to the other colonies, including New York. In New York, the member of this secret society was Alexander McDougall. When the New York chapter realized they needed to add someone who could handle finances, Alexander McDougall spoke up. He knew just the man, a Jewish man who had come to America looking for freedom, Haim Solomon. Haim Solomon had only been in America for a short time, just a few months at this point, but he had already set up a bank and was doing really well. Haim Solomon joined the Sons of Liberty. He knew his family had moved from country to country, looking for a place where the Jews could be free. 
But perhaps it was time to stop running. Perhaps it was time to create a place where the Jews could be free. At this point, there was about 2.5 million people, including slaves, living in America. Only 2,000 of them were Jews. Yet those 2,000 Jews sided with the Patriots and wanted a country where they could be free. That same year, the American Revolution officially started. I'm Solomon had come to America, joined the Sons of Liberty, and was involved in a war all within a few months. By 1776, it was not looking good for the Sons of Liberty. George Washington's army had been driven out of New York, and British commander Sir William Howe decided to put his army in New York for the winter. The citizens did not allow this without fighting back. The soldiers were harassed, targeted, and it was clear they were not safe. Fires were set. It was clear the British had to put their foot down. The soldiers began arresting anyone they found suspicious. Alexander MacDougall escaped to New Jersey, but Heim Solomon stayed behind. He decided to stay and be a spy, to let General Washington know what the British were doing in New York. He pretended to be loyal to Britain. However, he was captured, arrested, and charged with being a member of the Sons of Liberty. The British tried to get information from Heim Solomon about the location of the Sons of Liberty and his friend Alexander MacDougall, but Heim would not give them any information. He was tortured and kept in a prison in extremely bad conditions and while he was there, he became very sick. It was a sickness he would suffer with for the rest of his life. The courts found Heim guilty, and he was sentenced to be hanged. However, it became known that Heim spoke many languages fluently. The fact that his family had lived so many places while trying to find freedom proved to be an asset. There were a group of soldiers that only spoke German, and the British army could not communicate with them properly. Heim was released under the order that he would help interpret for the British army. This put Heim Solomon into an even better position as a spy. He also began to speak to the Germans in their language about freedom and convinced many of them to switch sides and fight for the Americans. He also worked to help many prisoners escape. During this time, he met a young lady named Rachel. Rachel's father was Moses Franks, and her brothers were Jacob and Isaac Franks. Jacob Franks was killed fighting in the war and Isaac Franks would one day become one of the first Supreme Court judges in Pennsylvania. After Heim Solomon and Rachel were married, and they had had their first child who was only a month old, Heim found out that Alexander MacDougall had been realized to be a spy. The British army was on to them, and the spy ring they were using began to unravel. The British troops realized that Heim Solomon had been sending information to George Washington and they came for him late one night. He was arrested and again put in prison. He was held with the rest of the men from the spy ring. Heim Solomon, remember, was Jewish and had memorized most of the Old Testament, including the Psalms. Many of the prisoners held were Christians and were set to be executed the next day. He sat and quoted from Psalms to help give them peace. One prisoner, in particular, was very young, only 21 years old and Heim Solomon stayed with him until the very end. His name was Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale died, and his last words were, I only regret that I have only one life to give. Heim Solomon had sewn money into his clothes, and he bribed the prison guards. He escaped during the night and fled to Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, he became friends with a man named Robert Morris. Robert Morris was in charge of the finances for Congress, and Heim Solomon began to help him raise the money. In 1781, it looked as if the Americans were going to lose the war. The soldiers had not been paid. Some of them hadn't been paid for two years. They didn't have proper shoes or coats. They were hungry, freezing, and their family had not been taken care of because they were not getting paid and had no money to send to their families. The soldiers were done. They began to get ready to defy George Washington and lay down their guns and surrender to England. George Washington wrote to Robert Morris and asked for $20,000. Robert Morris replied, there just was no money, none. Parliament's banks were empty. He had no money to send. George Washington told him to call for Heim Solomon and ask him to find the money. Heim Solomon spoke to the Jewish community asking for money. And he said, it is not our duty to leave wealth for our children, but it is our duty to leave them freedom. Heim raised the $20,000, 
and the soldiers were paid, clothed, and fed. And not only that, they realized the people did support them, and they were encouraged to not give up. The Jewish people were not the only ones who listened to what Haim Solomon had to say. Everyone began to give. Haim himself lent $600,000 to Congress. 400000 of that was never paid back. September the 3rd, 1783, the war officially ended. At that point, the population of Philadelphia had around 40,000 people, and 350 of them were Jews. Robert Morris and Solomon lobbied to make it a law that there would never be any religious test oaths for any office held under the state constitution. I'm Solomon never recovered from the sickness he got while in prison. He died in 1785. He had only lived in America for 10 years. During those 10 years, he joined the Secret Society Sons of Liberty. He became a spy. He was arrested and sentenced to death twice. He raised the money necessary to stop the American soldiers from quitting, and he gave up his own fortune to establish a new country. And then he helped create a law to make sure there would never be a religious test for office. His brother-in-law eventually became judge in the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. He died with no money. His children were very young, and he did not leave them any money. But he left them something else. Freedom. His oldest son, Ezekiel, became the man in charge of the finances for the United States Navy. His younger son, Haim, became a businessman in New York City. His grandson and great-grandson became prominent bankers. The family was never repaid the money they lent to the government for the war, but the freedom they could live under allowed them to be successful. This was not the end of Jewish bigotry by any means. It was, however, the start of a new relationship between the church and the Jews. The Jews would not have a place where they would be totally free for another 163 years. But when Israel was reborn, it was the United States of America and the Evangelical Church that stood with them and helped them. We're going to cover that in great detail later. People did attack Solomon in the press during his lifetime, and they questioned his loyalty. Could he be a Jew and loyal to America? This is what he said. I am a Jew. It is my own nation. I do not despair that we should obtain every other privilege that we aspire to enjoy along with our fellow citizens. Today, the anti-Jew sediment is back even here in Canada and in the United States, and unfortunately, it is beginning to come back to the church as well. We're going to talk much more in upcoming episodes about the Jews and the church. Next week, we're going to tell the story of the American Revolution again, but from a different point of view. To make sure you don't miss it, you should subscribe. And in the meantime, you can check out my Etsy page for some cool mugs. You can also check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com, for more podcasts blogs, and videos. I'll see you next week.